We may be few in numbers this morning, but hopefully not in the quality of the worship that God's receiving from us. Back this summer, I preached a, a sermon titled, Nailed to the Cross and Crucified with Christ. It's from Galatians 2, verse 20. And I had intended to do a second part to that verse, and you know, it always bothered me because I didn't take advantage of the opportunities I have to follow through. The one that I did, I'll call the first part, we talked about the big picture of crucifixion and talked about some of the historical things and factors and events that were associated with it. And then we kind of zoomed in and we looked at the cross of Christ and the two robbers on either side. And then we went from that to the call that the scripture gives us, a call to crucify our selfish and our worldly desires. And for that second part, what I had intended to do was go to Galatians 2.20 and spend some more time looking at that verse, but then look before and after it also to kind of get the big picture and then uh, the details of what that verse is really telling us. Because if you consider that scripture, the inspired Apostle Paul made a truly profound statement. It's very convicting if we think about it. And we allow it to soak in what it's actually saying. And to remind you, Paul wrote this, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. What an insightful metaphor of both self-crucifixion and sanctification because it gets right down to defining what the result of saving faith really looks like. What does it look like? That's what we're going to see in the scripture. It was Paul's testimony about his life and the power that the cross of Christ had in his life, the effect that it had on his life and how the cross became a pivotal point for him that delineated the life that he had before he came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and the life that he had after, a pivotal point. Paul, of course, began as Saul. He was zealous for God, but on the wrong side of what God wanted him to do, but he didn't know it. He just knew what he'd been taught, and he was living it out with every bit of vigor that he could muster. But when he came to the cross, Paul was nailed to that cross. He nailed his former self-righteous ways to the cross. The life he lived after the cross no longer thrived on vain attempts to keep the law. That's what he was trying to do before, but not what he tried to do after. His new life was based on faith alone in Christ alone, and his commitment, as his life was committed before, now it was committed to serving Christ as his Lord and Savior. So there was two things about this insightful metaphor of Galatians 2.20, the self-crucifixion and God's sanctification. So what is sanctification and God's sanctification? The dictionary, if we wanted to go there, well, first off, I will just say this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, sanctification is God's will for us. And if it's God's will for us, we ought to know what it is. So what is sanctification? It's a long word, but a short definition. It means to make holy. So God's sanctification is God making the receiver holy. Being sanctified doesn't make us sinless. Being sanctified doesn't take away temptation that we all have. And being sanctified doesn't mean we won't continue to struggle with sin because Paul did. We know that in Romans 7, 19. Remember what he said? The things that I, I want to do, I don't do. But the things that are evil, I keep on doing. And then he went on to say, what a wretched man I am. But he understood sanctification because God sanctified Paul through the indwelling Holy Spirit that he gave him that overflowed and outpoured from Paul 
and everyone else that God is saving. So which of us, um, I guess those in our Sunday school class understand that because we've been talking about it, about that well of water springing up to eternal life in John 4.14. 4, but today what I wanted to do is take this verse and do a little more than I did last time, which before it just became the basis of the discussions that we looked at in crucifixion and self-crucifixion in the end. But this time I wanted to break down that verse. And when I say verse, I'm really not talking about one, but there's, it's kind of like music. You, you have music and it kind of builds up to a crescendo and then it drops back off. Well, we're going to start before it and kind of let it build up to that 220 and then we're going to let it fall off at the end of it and see what the whole picture is that God is revealing to us through Paul's writing. And so today what I want to do is look at three aspects of Galatians 2.20 and the meaning of it. When I say that, I'm talking again about the bigger picture of the verses around it. The context of the verse is one. The context of the verse. And the second is the content of the verse. And the third one is... Um, is the challenges presented by the verse, which there are. So the first, to talk about the context of the verse, and again, that's the word, so let's, we don't use every day. What is context? What does it mean? Webster says, context means the circumstances that form the setting for an event or a statement. Simplified, what I would say is, is what happened to bring about Galatians 2.20? Can we tell from the scriptures before and after it? Can we understand maybe more about the meaning of where it's coming from and why it laid in there where it did in Galatians? And the answer is yes, and the hint is it's going to be different probably than you would expect what brought it about. Think of it this way. If you want to get people's attention, start an argument in public, write about it, and publish it. Because that's basically what happened. I mean, literally, that's the backdrop. So we said we're going to look before. So let's back up from Galatians 2.20 to Galatians 2.11. And Paul's writing about it as he's building up. He starts off slow and he's building up, telling us the framework. And then he comes to the verse. And he says this, starting verse 11. But when Cephas, who by the way, that's also the name for Peter. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof. I don't really like the way that one's worded. This is the New American Standard. I like maybe some of the others that say he began to draw back and to separate himself, and then it goes on to say, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, and the result that even Barnabas was carried away by hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, Live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? That's a really good question, isn't it? It's a dust-up going on between Paul and Peter. And it goes far beyond our purposes today. And frankly, there's really too many unknowns here to get bogged down on this one. But what is clear is that Paul stood up Peter... And he confronted him over two scripturally sound reasons for what was going on, and he called him on it. And the first one was Peter was acting against his conscience. Romans 14, 23 tells us is if your conscience is telling you to do something and we're talking about something godly and you don't do it, it's sin. Or whatever your conscience is telling you to do, if your conscience is telling you to do something and you don't do it, then that is sin, Scripture says. The second thing that Peter did wrong is he was acting against the revelation that God had revealed to him. So in other words, God told him to do something and he's not doing it. And that also sinned. 
And the details of that are found in Acts 10. That's really the basis of what's happening that Paul is calling him out on. And then it also happens again, it, it's, it's kind of retold by Peter. This time, though, Peter gets it right. He's in front of the Jewish council in Jerusalem, and he relives the story. He's telling them about it, and Peter holds his line this time. But we're going to look at the one Paul's talking about first. Keep in mind, Paul was the, the apostle to the Gentiles, but Paul wasn't the first one to preach to the Gentiles. Acts 10 tells us Peter was. It was Peter who received the vision from the Lord to go to the house of Cornelius, the Gentile. It was Peter who obeyed and went. It was the Gentiles there in Cornelius' house that listened to the, what Peter was sent to tell them, and they obeyed, and, uh, and they received the Holy Spirit, Acts 10, 45. And the circumstances of receiving the Holy Spirit for them was different than what you'll see throughout the New Testament where they received the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit after they were baptized. But these in Cornelius' house were not. And we kind of understand why Peter kind of opens the lid and shows us what his thoughts were but by what he did in Acts 10. So after they received the message, after they believed, after the God put his spirit on them, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, Peter said, well, why shouldn't we baptize these with water? Because they've, God's already shown us that they're approved. So he went ahead and baptized them in the name of Jesus after that. And all the other cases, you see the gift of the Holy Spirit comes after baptism. What stirred Paul's righteous anger in Acts two, or Galatians 2 was Peter's reaction. It was both compromising and deceitful. And the story is, James, the brother of Jesus, who was over the Jewish council in Jerusalem, sent people out on mission trips, and he sent a group of, uh, of, of Jewish Christian believers to go um, and check up on what's going on. Peter knows they're coming. Peter was going, before they got there, Peter was going into the homes of the Gentile converts, sharing meals with them, probably sharing the Lord's Supper with them also on the first day of the week. I mean, they, after all, they were uh, baptized believers and had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone knew that they were Christians, including all the Jews that were there with Peter at that time before this group came in from Jerusalem, and they were all glad about it. But when these certain men, it says in verse 12, arrived from uh, Jerusalem, sent by James, the leader, uh, again, of the church and brother of Jesus, it seems that Peter broke down the peer pressure. He withdrew his fellowship from the Gentile Christians. And it seems to me that Peter wasn't sure what these traditional uh, Jewish Christians thought because he knew a lot of them in Jerusalem believed even after believing, after getting the gift of the Holy Spirit, they still believed that you need to keep the law. And they also believed that you needed to be circumcised for the men. And so Peter wasn't sure how these people coming from Jerusalem were going to accept the, these Gentile believers. And so he started withdrawing his fellowship from them. And when he did, some of the other that were there with uh, Peter started with withdraw their fellowship from him. And then last of all, um, Barnabas, which must have been the least likely of all of them, the way I read it in scripture, that for it to say, and lastly, even Barnabas. I mean, why Barnabas like that? Because I think Barnabas was the least likely to have done that. So the whole group fell into hypocrisy, Galatians 2.13. Paul immediately saw the negative reflection that it had on the gospel of God's grace and also the unity of the church. I mean, after all, these were baptized believers. So Peter's reaction implied that the Gentile believers, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and received the Holy Spirit, needed to live like the Jews, Galatians 2.14. 
by keeping the law of circumcision is what they're talking about. Many of the Christian Jews still believe that. And they believed it was necessary, which is heresy. Now, whatever good we can say about Peter, and there's a lot we can say good about him, it seems that Peter was dodging the uh, message of the cross and justification by grace of God. And also, he was dodging the, dodging the, the concept of dying as far as the law is concerned and living as far as Christ is concerned. And for the record, it wasn't Peter's first time to slip up on this uh, rebuking and dodging the, the crucifixion, crucif crucified life. It happened right after um, in Caesarea Philippi when he made the great confession. Remember that Jesus was there, the disciples were there, and he asked him, what do you say? Who do you say I am? And Peter was the first one that answered that. And he was so precise and concise in what he said. He says, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Some scriptures or translation says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, Matthew 16, 16. And it wasn't five verses later that Jesus began to tell his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem he had to go through great suffering at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and that he would be killed, and on the third day he would raise from the dead. And Peter says, whoa, time out. And he pulled Jesus to the side. Remember what he said? He told Jesus, God forbid it, this must never happen to you. And what did Jesus say? He fired right back. Get behind me, Satan. Now, that's one thing we don't want to hear Jesus tell us. And I'm sure Peter didn't either. And Jesus went on to say, you're a stumbling block to me, for you do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. So he was dodging the message of the cross even then. And Jesus used that at this point to teach um, another lesson, and this is still in Matthew 16 and 24 through 26. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Peter had his moments. And don't forget it was Peter's refusal to accept the cross that eventually caused him to deny the Lord when he was arrested. And it came right on the hills after boasting that I'd lay down my life for you, John 13, 37. This happened before they received the Holy Spirit. But you know, for Christians, we can't say that because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit Still, we live in a time when the message of the crucified life is one that we don't really like to talk about. The last thing that Christians want to hear preached about or talked about, majority of Christians at least, is the cross. When it comes to this time of the year, we want to talk about the cradle and everybody is for that. They want to hear about Jesus being born in, a, in the cradle and um, they want to, uh, in the spring of the year, maybe talk about uh, Christ's resurrection and the second coming. But when it comes to the cross, people don't want to talk about it. And it's probably because we're having a Peter moment. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 says that the message of the cross is a stumbling block to some and foolishness to others. And we probably just, we might not realize it, but when our conscience is telling us to say something about it and we don't, we're sinning. And the reason we're probably doing it is because we don't know how the person we're talking to is going to take it, so we just don't lay it out there. And we're just as guilty as Peter was when we do that. That's the short answer of the context or the environment or the what brought about 
Galatians 2.20. The second aspect is the content of the verse. In substance, it is known as the doctrine of justification. By grace alone, through faith alone. Martin Luther, he was a German theologian and religious reformer in the early 16th century. He wrote commentaries. And I went, and one of the good thing you can do about all this computer stuff is you can go read commentaries of Martin Luther. And here's what I found on Galatians 2.20. Martin Luther wrote this in the early 16th century. Since Christ is now living in me, he abolishes the law, condemns sin, and destroys death in me. These foes vanish in his presence. Talking about the law, condemnation, sin, and death. Christ abiding in me drives out every evil. This union with Christ delivers me from the demands of the law and separates me from my sinful self. As long as I abide in Christ, Martin Luther says, nothing can hurt me. Paul states in Galatians 2.16, this is that kind of the front end. Uh, now we're building back toward 2.20. 2.16 says, Knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Faith in Christ is, is not an intellectual conviction alone, but a personal commitment. In the middle of that verse, we believe in Christ Jesus, it said in 2.16. But they say it translated, it really, what it means is, is we have believed into Christ Jesus. You know, just accepting alone the fact that Jesus lived and died doesn't save us. It's not an act of commitment. But running to him for refuge, calling on him for mercy, seeking him in prayer, seeking to serve him in our daily walk, and walking daily with him, these things are... Uh, evidence of saving faith. By reading the verses preceding Galatians 2.20, we can follow that Paul's argument, taken from his text in Psalms 143.2, that's what Paul was actually referring to. King David writes to God, For in your sight no man living is righteous. So Paul explains what it means by justification in Galatians 2.16. And he summarizes the concept of justification in Romans 5.18, where Paul writes this. So then, as through one transgression, talking about Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, talking about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, there resulted justification of life to all men. Justification refers to being declared legally righteous before God by faith in Christ Jesus. But it also calls for an ongoing transformation and a living identification in our lives with Christ. Can you see how this verse is so incredibly important to believers to understand? There's so many people that are under the believe only a flag and they just fly it high. I mean, they, they believe, they believe, they say they believe and they're just, they're missing it in their life. This explains clearly what life in Christ really means and our second aspect, which is the context or, or the content. Context was first, content of the verse second. And now the third aspect in Galatians 2.20 is the challenge of the verse. 
I'm going to read that verse again. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is the verse that speaks to sanctification. Not the act of God declaring a person righteous one time, as justification is, but instead is a continual process where God is making a person righteous. Sanctification is the deliverance from the power of sin and is a present and continuous process of believers becoming Christ-like. And how is it accomplished? Through the Holy Spirit's power and presence. Sanctification represents a believer's victory over the flesh. Romans 7, 24 and 25. The believer's victory over the world, 1 John 5, verse 4. And the believer's victory over the devil, James 4, verse 7. A famous theologian, John R. W. Stott, S-T-O-T-T, explained it this way. Jesus Christ came into the world to live and to die. In his life, his obedience to the law was perfect. In his death, he suffered for our disobedience. On earth, he lived the only life of sinless obedience to the law which has ever been lived. On the cross, he died for our law-breaking since the penalty for disobedience to the law was death. All that is required of us to be justified is to acknowledge our sin and helplessness, to repent of our years of self-assertion and self-righteousness, and to put our whole trust and confidence in Jesus Christ to save us. You know, if we can't grasp this, we're missing something just extremely and terribly important in our faith. The extinguished life means death to self and to sin. In his book, The Christ Life for the Self-Life, F.B. Meyer writes, The curse of the Christian, the curse of the Christian and of the world is self is our pivot. Self is our pivot. When Satan made self his pivot, that's when he became the devil, he writes. And he continues with this. Take heaven from its center in God and try to center it in self and you transform heaven into hell. The philosophy of the Bible, we are to do away with self and to make Christ our all in all. Going on the other side of Galatians um, 2.20, we're going to go way over. 5.24 and 25, now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That's God's call, and that is our challenge this morning. Can you say, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Our title this morning is No Longer I, But Christ in Me. You ever thought about when people look at you, do they just see you? Some probably do. But others may not. Others may see Christ. It may depend on what we're doing. If we think about the wording of Galatians 2.20, we realize that following Christ is not about religious activity. It's not about showing up at the proper day and time. It's not about moral improvement, just trying to live a little better, do a little better. It's about a life-altering surrender to Christ. 
we die to our old self and our old sinful nature, our sinful desires, our selfish ambitions, and we live as Christ because Christ lives in us. And this changes everything about how we live our lives. Because our lives, if we're truly saved, our lives become centered around Christ and His mission. Our pursuits are about what pleases Him. We live not by our strength and our wisdom, but by faith in the Son of God who loved us and died for us. Have you embraced the transformation? Have you surrendered your old self and let Christ live in you? Will you commit your life? Will you be driven by Christ and his love for you? Will ye live as Paul declared in Philippians 1, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, listen to what he says, this will mean fruitful labor for me. It's just like he said, it's better to go than to stay, to be with Christ than to be here. But if I am, if my calling is to be here, then that just means Fruitful labor for me. In Romans, we have the cross as the justification of putting the sins away. In Galatians, Paul speaks to sanctification by the cross. Paul declares that cross is standing between me and my past, between me and the world, between who I was and who I am now even between me and myself. And here's how Paul declared it. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Justification happens when God declares a guilty sinner to be righteous. And sanctification happens when God continues making the believing sinner righteous. It's a continual act. So here's the question. For God's invitation to those God is calling to respond, have you been crucified with Christ? Have you embraced the transformation by faith in the Son of God? If your answer is no, I haven't, is God calling you to do that now? See, it's not our invitation. It never is. It's God's. It's God who calls. If God is calling you, will you obey him? We've got a song that's not a traditional song of invitation. But it's about some wise men seeking Jesus. I guess in that regard, wise people are always seeking Jesus. If God has given you wisdom this morning, will you come as together we stand and sing?